Sutra of the Past Vows of Earth Star Bodhisattva Contemplating the Karmic Conditions of Beings Chapter 3 Commentary This third chapter is called Contemplating the Karmic Conditions of Living Beings To contemplate means to observe What are living beings? A multitude of causal conditions create living beings who become born from pursuing different states why do we say they are formed as a result of many causes? The multitude of causal conditions includes form, feeling, cognition, formation, and consciousness, which create a physical body as grasping occurs. Living beings are born because we pursue different states. Those who are born from such causes and conditions are living beings. Karma. Where does karma come from? Karma may be created through speech, physical action, or thoughts. Why is the result karma instead of causes? Causal conditions refer to a single incident. Karma is an accumulation of many causal conditions after a long period of time. Conditions are a set of circumstances that create karma. Every living being has his or her own karmic conditions, and the states that he or she experiences are different. Some living beings always encounter happy states. Why? In the past, they planted good causes, and therefore, in this lifetime, they reap good results. Some living beings always face very difficult situations. Why? It is because in the past, they did not plant good causes. They sold bad ones instead. Over time, these bad causes turn into bad karma. Hence, they face such miserable retributions in this lifetime. In general, plant good causes and reap good results. Plant bad causes and reap bad results. We create good and evil personally. No one else makes us do it. This applies throughout our path to Buddhahood. A destination reached not because other people made us, but because of our own hard work at cultivation. Working hard at cultivation is about planting the causes for Buddhahood, which leads to Buddhahood in the future. Do the work of Buddhas and become Buddhas in the future. Do the work of demons and become demons. Did the text not say earlier that the hells are called forth in response to the three evil karmas? Sutra, at that time, the Buddha's mother, Lady Maya, placed her palms together respectfully and asked Earth Star Bodhisattva, Great Sage, could you tell us about the different kinds of karma that beings of Jambuvipa create and the resulting retributions that they undergo? Earth Star replied, There are many millions of walls and lands that may or may not have health may or may not have women, may or may not have the Buddha Dharma, and so forth, up to having or not having hearers and Pratika Buddhas. Since the ones differ, the retributions in the house also differ. Commentary At that time, the Buddha's mother, Lady Maya, gave birth to the Buddha from her left armpit. She died from Hamoha H and was, was reborn in the heavens. After Shakyamuni Buddha became enlightened, he spoke drama for 49 years in over 300 drama assemblies. The day before yesterday, someone said the Buddha lectured on more than 300 sutras. That is wrong. The Buddha held over 300 drama assemblies. The Buddhist sutras are not limited to more than 300. There are more than several thousand. When the Buddha was about to enter Nirvana, he recalled that he had not delivered his mother to the shroud of perfection. So he went to the Chaja Shrimsha heaven to speak the drama for Lady Maya. Now Lady Maya placed her palms together respectfully and asked Earth Star Bodhisattva, Great Sage, could you tell us about the different kinds of karma that beings of Jambuvipa create? and the resulting retributions that they undergo. How does this happen? So Lady Maya, a star bodhisattva, replied, There are many millions of walls and lands that may or may not have health. For instance, 
the land of Antimic Bliss has neither hells nor any of the three evil paths. On the other hand, our Saha world embodies the three evil paths, the hells, the realm of ghosts, and the realm of animals. Those places may or may not have women. Some worlds, ours, for example, have both men and women as well as creatures and common people. The land of Antimic Bliss has only men. If there were no women, how can there be men? Don't you worry. When the men go to the world of Antimic Bliss, they are still men. When the women get there, they become men too. Where do the people of the land of Antimic Bliss come from? Who gives birth to them? If there are no women, how can there be people? This you do not know. The people in the world of Antimic Bliss do not come from women, but are born transformationally from lotuses. When we recite the Buddha's name once here, our mother, the lotus in the land of Antimic Bliss, grows a bit. The more we recite here, the more our flower grows. The more sincere our recitation, the more fresh our lotus becomes. After death and before becoming reborn as a human, a ghost or a spirit, our eighth consciousness is in a state between skandhas or the intermediate skandha body. If we recite the Buddha's name sincerely, when we die, our intermediate skandha body will immediately enter the lotus. When the lotus blooms, the trite in the land of Antimic Bliss is born. Since birth originates with lotuses, there are only men and no women. May or may not have Buddha drama. Perhaps there is the Buddha drama from the Buddhas there who are speaking the drama or drama that abides in this country or this world. There are places where no one speaks the drama, where there are no Buddha images, sutras, or monastics. The Buddhist sutras say such a place exists in northern Uttarakuru, one of the eight places of difficulty because it does not have any Buddha drama, and so forth after having or not having hearers and Pratyeka Buddhas. There may or may not be any sound hearers, Pratyeka Buddhas or Bodhisattvas in these worlds. From the point of view of ordinary people, sound hearers are very happy. In the eyes of the Bodhisattvas, however, sound hearers also suffer. So these ones may or may not have sound hearers or practical Buddhas who suffer. Since the ones differ, the retributions in the house also differ, regardless of who you are. Create karma and you will face the much retribution. Avoid karma if you want to avoid the, the, the retribution that follows. This principle is impartial and equal. Sutra Lady Maya spoke again to the Bodhisattva. Could you please tell us about the offenses committed by those in Jambuvipa that result in retributions in the evil destinies? Earth Star replied, Worthy Mother, please listen as I speak briefly about that. The Buddha's mother answered, Great Sage, please do tell us about it. The Earth Star Bodhisattva said to the Worthy Mother, Retributions that result from offenses committed in Jamufipa are described like this. Beings who are not filial to their parents, even to the point of harming or killing them, will fall into the relentless hell where for thousands of billions of ends they will seek escape in vain. Commentary Lady Maya spoke again to the Bodhisattva. The Buddha's mother repeated to Earth Star Bodhisattva, Could you please tell us about the offenses committed by those in Jambuvipa that result in retributions in the evil destinies? The other worlds are too far away and I have not been to them, even if I have, I do not remember. Therefore, I ask not about the other worlds but only of Jambuvipa. I wish to know the offenses of those in Jambuvipa, the evil destinies that result, and the retribution from different offenses. I would like to listen. Will the sagely one please tell me? 
When Earth Star Bodhisattva heard the Buddha's mother plead in this manner, he answered, Worthy mother, please listen to what I have to say. As I speak briefly about that type of principle, I will not explain it in detail because I may not even finish in seven great ends. The Buddha's mother answered, Great sage, please do tell us about it. The Buddha's mother heard what Earth Star Bodhisattva said and responded, I am most delighted and wish for the Bodhisattva to speak. Earth Star Bodhisattva said to the worthy mother, Retributions that result from offenses committed in Jambufripa are described like this. At that time, Earth Star Bodhisattva told the Buddha's mother that in this world of Jambufripa, the names of the house in response to offenses created and retributions received are as many as the ones which he shall describe. Beings who are not filial to their parents, even to the point of harming or killing them, we living beings should be filial to our parents. For those who are not filial commit offenses, even to go as far as murdering them, all these are offenses. Filial piety is important because it is the basis of humanity. If people are not filial, they forget their very origin. Therefore, it is said, Father gave me a life, Mother raised me, their kindness, as vast as, as high heaven, as manifold as the hairs on the head, is difficult to repay. What is filial piety? Does it mean buying delicious foods for our parents? Is it filiality to buy them some fun clothes? No, these are superficial forms of filial piety. Filial piety is about complying with our parents. I enjoy what my parents delight in. I like what my parents like. Suppose my mother likes to smoke opium. If he smoked one ounce a day and I smoke two, would that be filial piety? It certainly would not. When I said comply, I mean to comply with his wishes, not with his eating habits. If the latter were intended, you might as well tell your father who likes bread and butter. I like that too. You're just going to have to wait while I eat it. That would be fighting, not complying. To comply means to accord with another's wish. Look into his heart and do not go against his wishes. That is filiality. Earlier I said the kindness of parents is as manifold as the hairs on the head and difficult to repay. Even if you could count how many hair you have, you still would not be able to repay your parents' kindness. Last summer, I mentioned the couplet, The lamb needs to drink its milk. The young crow returns to the nest. When the baby lamb drinks its mother's milk, it falls enough late. Crows are considered filial birds in China because young crows return with food for their aged mother who can no longer fly. Even baby crows know to be filial. Crows are um, birds and lambs are animals. If we were not filial to our parents, we are worse than we are worse than birds and beasts. Human beings are supposed to be replaced with the five virtues: humanness, propriety. Righteousness, wisdom, and trustworthiness. Since we are being virtuous in these five ways, how can we be worse than crows and sheep? There is nothing more important than be being filial to our parents. Someone might ask, I want to be filial, but now I have fled the whole life and my parents are nowhere nearby. How can I be filial? Living the whole life is an act of great filial piety. That is a saying, when one child enters the Buddha's door, nine gener generations of ancestors ascend to the heavens. If you leave home and cultivate the way, nine generations of ancestors receive the benefit and may go to the heavens. In this way, you are being filial not only to your parents, but to your ancestors and parents of lives past. Of course, you must continue to cultivate. If you do not do so, your nine generations of relatives will fall into the house where they will will and mourn. 
We had a descendant who left the home life to cultivate, and because of him, we should have been born in the heavens. Who would have thought that he is so lazy that he sleeps all day instead of cultivating? Now our offenses cannot be pardoned, so we fall into the hell once again. The mere act of living home life is not sufficiently powerful to cause your nine generations of ancestors to reborn in the heavens. If you do not cultivate, they will not enter the heavens. But if you do cultivate, you are practicing great frivolity that helps your parents. Speaking of which. I was in the Buddha hall for some time today and thought we have a Shramanara who has not been up. Even I, the teacher without any fiery temper, a、uh, temper, without any fiery temper, was on fire. How can a monk be so lazy? I thought it was not bad though. He did not rebut at all. Upon investigating, I figured out why. Let me tell you all: this Ramanara is not lazy. He was too hungry to move. Not lazy, just hungry. Why was he hungry? No one made offerings. After going many days without any offerings, he tried alms rounds, but no one donated anything. His temper flagged, and when he came back, he decided not to eat. It's been six or seven days. And he has not eaten anything, so today he was too hungry to get up. Since I did not realize that he received no offerings, I scolded him severely. Afterwards, I inquired as to why he was this lazy. He said, "No one made offerings to me, and without food, I have no energy." Upon hearing this, I replied, "Oh, I made a mistake. If you feel too weak, then you can rest and sleep inside." Do what you need to do. I'm giving you an expedient. It's not easy being a teacher. Sometimes you don't know what method of teaching and transforming is suitable. I scolded a hungry disciple severely. However, this disciple has some skill, a bit of cultivation. Without any cultivation, how can one go on without food for six to seven days and still follow the general assembly in reciting sutras? Doing repentances and listening to the lectures, so my anger is gone now, and I am glad I have a hardworking disciple. I hope all of you will emulate this Ramanara who had enough patience to withstand my scolding. In addition, forget the fact that I did not eat for a day. I did not eat for two days. I did not eat for three days, five days, six days. Forget it. Having eaten or not is the same. Don't pay attention to whether you have eaten or not. Forgetting that you are really cultivating, you could not forget if you were not really cultivating. True concentration is derived from true practice. With real concentration, you will not notice that I'm scolding you, not to mention hitting you. Questions like who's hitting me or where am I? Do not even occur because there is no I. When there is no self, there is true concentration. If there's still an I, so that you hit me, you scold me, and I haven't eaten, still exist, then you haven't forgotten the self. Consequently, concentration will not grow. We must forget the self before concentration develops. When concentration is born, you have some real skill. Beings who are not filial to their parents. Even to the point of harming or killing them, those who kill their father or mother, for example, will fall into the relentless hell, where for thousands of billions of ants they will seek escape in it in vain. It will be difficult for them to escape the hells. Sutra: Beings who shed the Buddha's blood, slander the Trip Guru, and do not venerate sutras will fall into the relentless hell. Where for thousands of billions of ants, they will seek escape in vain. Commentary: Beings who shed the Buddha's blood. Suppose innocent living beings do commit some offense, such as shed the Buddha's blood. Now that Shakyamuni Buddha entered Nirvana, how can we make the Buddha bleed? We do not live in a time when the Buddha is in the world, 
and have never seen the Buddha. How can we make the Buddha bleed? When the Buddha was in the world, shedding his blood means injuring the Buddha's physical body. After his nirvana, it means destroying images of the Buddha, such as removing an ear or a finger. Burning paper images of the Buddha, for instance, is also equivalent to shedding the Buddha's blood. In principle, these offenses cannot be vindicated through repenting and reforming, but there are exceptions, such as when intoxicated or overtaken by madness or mental breakdown. However, you cannot claim to be mentally ill or drunk, but commit these offenses intentionally. It is when unintended that these comic offenses are lighter. The Buddha had such great spiritual powers. Who could have shed his blood? The Buddha had certified to the fruit. Who could have hurt the, his physical body? Sometimes even the Buddha gets injured unexpectedly. The Buddha's cousin, Devadatta, opposed everything the Buddha did and invariably tried to ruin him. If the Buddha said something was proper, Devadatta would contradict him. He did everything he possibly could to under, undermine the Buddha. Once, when the Buddha was speaking, Devadatta bribed a poor woman to take part in a plot against the Buddha, as is the case with many impoverished persons. He herself was weak and she would do anything for money. Devadatta had her tie, a pillow around her waist, waist under her clothes and in this condition go to the Buddha's Dharma assembly to accuse him of fathering her unborn child. Devadatta promised her a large sum of money for making the Buddha no longer credible to his disciples. When this woman followed suit and told the Buddha's disciples that she is pregnant with the Buddha's tribe, the Buddha used his spiritual powers to make the pillow fall to the ground, proving on the spot that she was dishonest. That was how Devadatta used various means to damage the Buddha. Another time, the Buddha was walking by Vantra Peak when Devadatta, hoping to crush the Buddha, used his spiritual powers to cause an avalanche. A Vara knight and guardian spirit of Vantra Peak named Pela used his Vara pestle to smash one of the large boulders which was about to hit the Buddha. One of the fragments, however, struck the Buddha's little toe and cracked a bone. At that very moment, a fiery chariot emerged to carry Devadatta alive off to the house. The retribution incurred by those who burn and destroy images of the Buddha, dismantled temples or ruins to pass is similar. Slander the triple jewel. Buddhists must remember not to commit this type of offense, that is to speak evil of the Buddha, the Dharma, and the Sangha. Among the Bodhisattva precepts is one that prohibits people from speaking of the offenses of the fourfold assembly, the bhikshus, bhikshunis, upasakas, upasikas. Not only does it warn pupils refrain from speaking of other forms, it is also cautious against participating when others speak of them. Just ignore the conversation. If you participate in such a conversation, you also violate the precept. The best thing to do in a situation like this is to simply keep your mouth shut, remain silent.